Mr. Clyde Morgan, owner of Precision Shooting Center in Forest, Mississippi, is our guest. We appreciate him joining us here on Middays. Mr. Morgan, you all set? Yes, sir. Thank you, George. Gotcha. All right, so um, we wanted to have you in in the wake of this horrific shooting that occurred uh, over in Uvalde, Texas. We've been talking about it all morning, but what are your thoughts about that? It's a symptom of a larger issue. And what is that issue, in your view? Well, the destruction of the family. Yeah. Well, you and I are aligned on that uh, position. I agree as well, and I believe that is at the core of virtually all of uh, that which plagues our society, from uh, crime and incivility. We've been talking about that this morning and lack of respect for human life and our economic uh, problems as well, I think, uh, can all be um, rooted in and, and are all rooted in the breakdown of the traditional family. And we've witnessed that um, certainly in my lifetime, your lifetime. We, we have been around enough to, uh, generations to see how that's changed. Um, and, that, and we see organizations in this country and politicians as well who dismiss that concept and, in fact, are critical and believe that somehow if you support the idea of a, a nuclear family that you're a racist now. Children lack the love that they need. I have witness professionally the broken homes and what happens to children who are abused and uh, it really is disheartening to know that in looking at some children they really do not stand a chance of support. Uh, my background includes several opportunities of, of working with young people. I was in the military, I was in corrections and criminal justice in the military. This is, this is rather intra funny, but uh, I was a little basic training company commander down at Fort Polk for 10 cycles, about 3,000 trainees. In the third cycle, I started becoming accustomed to a mother or father or both, both walking up and saying, Lieutenant Morgan, what did you do? Look at him. He stands so straight <laughs> and tall, and his shoes are shining, his bed is made, and he says, yes, sir, no, sir, what did you do? And my first sergeant, who was with 82nd Airborne during the Second World War and captured by the Germans, he said, just tell them we just talked to them. <laughs> yeah, all right. We talked to them. We had total control over them, and we made them do what they did not want to do when we told them to do it. Yeah. And now children don't have that. No. No. So a little discipline you introduced into their lives. Of course. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I, I can share kind of a, a personal story. I've coached youth baseball. I've talked about that on the air before 25 years. And I, I'll never forget. And I had a set of rules. You know, I was a coach, and these are the rules, and I had those in writing, and I required even 10-year-olds to read the rules and sign a piece of paper saying they understood the rules and they'd abide by the rules. Now, some of the parents thought I was crazy. I actually called it a contract. I wanted them to get exposed to that idea. It's a two-way deal, two parties coming to an agreement. I'm going to coach. This is what I'm going to do. Right. You're going to play. This is what you're going to do. Right. And one of my rules was you carry your own equipment. Right. In the first game, I have a kid that's packing his equipment up, and here comes the dad into the dugout and helping and, and carrying the equipment out. I said, no, no, no. And they quit after that because I required the kid to carry their oh, own yeah. equipment. The, the parent objected to that. Yeah, the parent objected Obje to it, not the of kid. Of course, right. We're in trouble. Not the kid. It's yeah. like, no. Yeah. Today, it's not the police. The police are bumping into that problem because they are trying to arrest someone who's never right. been told yes or no. That's exactly right. We and, want to say yes. Our and pa and it's parents. amazing. And not just me. It's disheartening that people blame the police for that. But yeah. that, I, I think that is there's method to their madness. And, and that's the larger problem that yeah. I that I in in. Uh, I can't think of the right word, but in uh, I, I, in I spoke of okay. earlier. Yeah, and my so my concern is we've got 
uh, politicians who were in charge that just seize upon any narrative for personal political gain. And I think anything which truly does benefit uh, the country and make it safer and more prosperous, that's kind of secondary to whatever gets them elected or reelected. That's kind of the political world that we live in today. But they're who we all look to for solutions, and their solutions are, hey, whatever gets me reelected or elected, that's that's my position. Have you observed this as well? Do you have any thoughts per- about that? Personally, and it's there, there are not a lot of advantages to getting older, but perspective is one of the advantages. 1963. I left the jungles of Vietnam, landed in Travis Air Force Base with about 135 other uh, American soldiers, and we were greeted by uh, cursing and people calling us baby killers and unjust illegal war. And I had propaganda leaflets I picked up off the battlefield of Vietnam. Now, what's that got to do with the conversation today? There was a nascent socialistic movement in the 60s that was able to turn the American public against the most altruistic war ever fought. We were not in Vietnam to take their water buffalo, their rice paddies, or their rubber plantations. We were there part of CETO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, to stop the spread of communism throughout all of Southeast Asia. Right. And South Vietnam was on the southern tip. This was it. Somehow, yep. and some 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 movement took the most altruistic war we have ever fought, and we won. The American public gave it away, but by any metric, we won that war, and they gave it away. And some of my Vietnamese friends died. All of them lost their freedom and their nation. Okay, now fast forward to today. What's that got to do with today? Well, now. That socialistic movement, in my opinion, has, has infiltrated our educational system, the national uh, political system, the national media. And, and if anyone thinks just because they lose the midterm of the 24 elections, and they will, that they're going away, they really need to study a little bit of history. Yeah. Uh, well, I was around then. I was a little little young for, for service, but my brother served in the Strategic Air Command. And uh, I've always been fascinated uh, by the Vietnam War and got a collection of books that I've read about it, just consuming information. And I think that's because, uh, Mr. Morgan, it was played out on our television screens when I was, uh, you know, in elementary and middle school uh, every day with the the, de- the count of those who who were killed in action and um, or missing in action, wounded and so forth. It's like every day we're watching this and you would see reporters out in the fields. And we just didn't have that. No other war had had come to our living rooms in that sense and had also been photographed and and, uh, had been recorded on video as much as those tools didn't really exist and we didn't have folks in the fields. But anyhow, I've been fascinated by it. But, yeah, we essentially just left the country and departed Saigon um, and and really didn't get anything for all that loss of life and and loss of uh, treasure. Zero out of it. In fact, it went the other way after that. The other thing about the national news media is that if dog bites man, that doesn't make the news. If man bites dog, then that's all over the news. So if we made an error, if we killed the wrong person, if we, then that was big news. But the atrocities of the other side were not. Yeah. And once again, I get, and I'm not. Just one a person said one time, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not out to get me. Very true. <laughs> and, and after a while, I keep thinking there's some sub subliminal element in the United States that's trying to destroy us. Seems like it. So. Yeah, first of all, thanks for your service, sir. Um, you served in the U.S. Uh, infantry, in the infantry. In Company Durham commander. Vietnam. Yeah, so I, I'm reading that in your resume. And served two tours? I volunteered to go back, but the war was winding down. So. Yeah. Wow, that is uh, that is incredible. And so now um, you have this uh, company Precision Shooting Center in yes, Forest. Sir. We got a break right here. You can hang around with us. Come oh, back. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've got uh, Clyde Morgan. He's the owner of Precision Shooting uh, in Forest, Mississippi. Is our guest on middays. We'll be right back. Super Talk Mississippi in the Element Well Studios. Clyde Morgan, the owner of Precision Shooting Center in Forest, Mississippi, is our guest. All right, so uh, Clyde, we. 
we are uh, just a couple of days removed from this horrific incident in um, Uvalde, Texas, where a shooter, 18 years old, with very powerful rifles, enters the school. And I believe all of the carnage occurred in one classroom, is what's uh, being reported. Uh, 19 children, two teachers uh, murdered, slaughtered uh, at his hands. You were telling me on the break you had some ideas about that and perhaps uh, how to address that. What do you think? Well, I think the concept of school resource officers is excellent. I also know that it's expensive and that it, it requires manpower that could be doing something else. So I have given some consideration to where our society. Our society, by the way, our society is responsible for itself. You and I are responsible for ourselves, or we should be. We shouldn't be dependent always on law enforcement to do everything for us. Yeah. And I realize there are legal constraints on that and lots of dangers, but now we're talking serious issues. A man with a gun comes into a school and there's no police officer there, or the police officer is in the gym or out on the field, and within 15 to 30 seconds, the deed has been done in the average shooting. My goodness. Yeah. Very short window of time. There, were, there was a big discussion, and nothing came of it. There are always school teachers who are very qualified hunters or target shooters who easily could be certified to have a concealed carry weapon with them. And there are also three, three different categories of civilians in Mississippi who've been certified with firearms, and most people don't realize that. Your security guards, hmm. now our training standards uh, could be vastly improved for security guards, but, but they receive certification the church security teams receive certification, and, of course, there's enhanced concealed carry weapon. And, by the way, I was the first person in the state certified hmm. to teach the enhanced. So here are four different categories of civilians, perhaps some retired or some unduly wealthy. They would volunteer their time, but they would need a little bit of additional training, and it would be very demanding training not necessarily physical. We're not teaching them how to make an arrest. We're teaching them how to stop a shooter. Sure. And then call the police and let the police do the policing. Gotcha. Right. It just seems like, though, you and you just stated it, and I've been talking about it on the air, that there is such a compressed period of time that a lot of, of uh, carnage can be wielded that there's no perfect solution there. No, there's no perfect solution. But the bad guys want it easy. They look for people, old people, yeah. uh, young people, people who are walking across the street with a cell phone stuck in their ear, people who are busy and not paying attention to what's going on, blah, 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 yeah. blah. Yeah, that's who they're looking for. So if they realize, for instance, nursing homes, they're looking for places where they could go. We can't put a law enforcement officer in every place. Right. Yeah. So we should be responsible for ourselves sure. and step up to the plate. And we do have certified, we do have qualified people who can do that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I still believe that there should be more focus. Um, and and I, I get the impression you share this view. There should be more focus on what is what is causing these these attitudes? What's causing Absolutely. people to harbor such hate in their heart? And I, I know one of the things that comes up a lot is uh, just the, the mental illness issue that that often is is at play when we have these these mass shootings like this. But we have other countries that have got to have the same I would think same incidence of of uh, occurrence of mental illness that don't seem to have this problem the way we do here in this country. Without discussing that, because I'm not an expert. Yeah, me I'm either. I'm not an expert here, but, yeah. but uh, I was back in the 70s, I was working with AFDC, Aid Families with Dependent Children, yeah. and I'm visiting in the homes, and this is a small home, but it's very neat and clean, and, and the 
the uh, lady was a teacher, and in our conversation with her, I was uh, looking at the pictures, and I saw the pictures of the three children, and then I saw a picture of a man. And I said, is that the father? And, and she, I, today we would say she blinked. We didn't have that term back in the 70s. She definitely blinked. And then I, and I said, well, where is he? He said, he's a truck driver. And I said, and y'all, you're not married? And she said, oh, Mr. Morgan, I'd lose my check. Yeah. So in a, in a, at, yeah. uh, a, with AFDC and then later on with TANF, yep. uh, the uh, temporary assistance uh, yeah, for needy temporary families. Assistance, yeah. The, the TANF was an effort to try to put some responsibility on the, the individuals so that they they uh, they they had to be married and right. support their children. And we've done a miserable job of that. Yeah, we have, and you shared with me some statistics, and I, I've discussed this at length on the program just about the um, out-of-wedlock birth rate in this country, and not only has it steadily increased over the last 50, 60 years, uh, last I checked, Mississippi is at the top of the list in terms of teenage uh, pregnancies and out-of-wedlock births, and we just seem to We've normalized it. I think that's what's happened in society. There was a time when there was some degree of of shame and that you kind of violated, you breached uh, societal norms. But but now we we almost adulate it. We praise it. We we laud it. Uh, and and it it just seems like and and, I don't, this, and that's not something that could come any kind of admonishment. It couldn't come from you and me. It's got to come from people that 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 those who are are promiscuous or, or think it's okay, maybe have some change of heart and are influenced by somebody they respect. Um, but th- we've normalized this sort of the, behavior. The pill helped with that. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. the the pill enabled more sexual promiscuity without the consequences, but there were consequences because they forgot to take the pill. Yeah. They didn't do this, do that. And so the, the unwanted pregnancies uh, kind of mushroomed. Yeah. And then the individuals decided that, that they didn't have to marry anyway. And now we have the children suffering and now society suffering. And, and it's not the gun. Right. Right. And, 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 and th- this is my soapbox. Okay. If I am... A dictator. The first thing I do is register all firearms. Then I register all firearm owners. And then I make some firearms illegal. Does that kind of start Mm -hmm. sounding like AR-15s and 20-round magazines, 30? Then I prosecute all the violators. Then I make all firearms illegal. (laughs) Then I confiscate all the firearms. Then I arrest all the violators. (laughs) And then I arrest, incarcerate, and kill whomever I desire. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I'm alive because I grew up with guns. Yeah, I, I, I wrote about it. I was chased off the school grounds. My daddy had the meat market, and we were a block and a half from the school grounds. And it was 1945, and and I, I got tired of sleeping on the A and P sacks, so I'd go to the school grounds until the superintendent, Mr. Hubbard, came out one day and wrote, told me I couldn't play there. Up there, I'm five years old. I had a Colt revolver that was broken, that was given to me by the town marshal. Wow. Talk about how times change. <laughs> now I'd have a criminal record, but guns have always been a part, a tremendous part of my life. Yeah. And I've never been arrested and never done anything bad. So obviously you believe that uh, that we need to arm ourselves, that we need to be properly trained and equipped as a protection mechanism uh, against the, the few in society that are, are causing all, wreaking all this havoc, this committing all this violence. If I were a crook, I would not knowingly try to rob or break into some place where I knew the owner or the person was yeah. armed. Why yeah. would I do that? Yeah. Where would I look? Yeah, totally agree. It's it, it's, it's the same as um, I, I was in the IT business, and, and the folks that are looking to commit um, – Cyber breaches, uh, they just keep knocking on the doors till they find one that's open. They don't look for any particular target. Oh, there's an open one. That's where I'm going. That's what. It's the same deal. It's and nice people. We want to be nice. Yeah. I love what Patrick Swayze said in Roadhouse. What's that? You need to watch more movies now. 
<laughs> he, I read the, books, but don't watch a lot of movies. He's the primary bouncer, and after he cleaned the tables, we got about three, ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His underling came, said, "How do you do that?" And Swayze said, "Be nice until it's time to not be nice." Okay. Makes sense. I like that. Appreciate you coming on, Mr. Clyde Morgan, the owner of Precision Shooting Center, and thank you again, sir, for your service. We'll be right back on midday.